Kamitsky massacres, which are known as the Gezerot Tachvatat, the, the edicts of 1648 and 1649, also known as the Cossack Rebellion. This was the product of the, the stresses of the Arenda system. The Arenda is really a sharecropping system, and this is where Jews would manage the affairs of Polish nobility, often um, managing the affairs as it related to Polish, uh, to Ukrainian peasants, also known as Cossacks, the two kinds of Cossacks. There were registered Cossacks and unregistered Cossacks. It sounds like a funny term. The registered were ones that that the um, the Polish nobility had contracts with. They would pay them. They would give them promises of land, perhaps of noble status. It was the the offense specifically in that system, where a Polish nobleman tried or effectively dispossessed Bogdan Chmelnitsky, a very charismatic. Cossack leader, who then went to the traditional enemies of the Poles, the Tatars. I encourage you to go to last night's lecture to understand the relationship between the two. He makes an alliance with the Tatars, who were a Slavic nation of slave traders. And they, um, the two of them teamed up to fight the Polish overlords. But because the Jews were responsible for the um, for managing those systems, they were seen as the national natural enemies um, of the of the uh, of the the Jews were seen as, as sort of the tip of the spear, the enemies, the people who needed to be um, uh, uh, vengeance was visited upon. And we have chronicles of that time. One of which is called the Aven Mitzula, the Abyss of the Deep. It's a play on words with the word Yavan, which means Greek, because the Cossacks were Greek Orthodox, and. The Yuven Metzula describes in horrific and gruesome detail the massacres against the Jews. Um, some of the worst um, descriptions are they 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 um, cut open a pregnant woman, they put in a live cat into her womb, they sewed up her womb, they cut off her hands so she couldn't take out the uh, the stitches. These were uh, brutal individuals that literally raped, pillaged, and plundered and killed people for sport um, along the way. Um, so this is that was the Cossack massacre, the Khmelnytsky massacre. Tonight, what we want to deal with is what was the response from around the world? So the first thing that we're going to look at is there was one of Hanover's, Rabbi Natan Nata of Hanover's uh, descriptions where the Cossacks were on one side of the city, the, the Tatars were on the other side of the city, and they decided to throw themselves on the on the slave trading Tatars, rather than suffer the the brutality of the Cossacks, and so they took they were taken away in change by this sort of uh, these horse bound slave traders, the Tatars. And so here I just gave you a picture of the slave market in Istanbul, because as Hanover describes in his um, in his Yven Mitzula, in his Abyss of Deep, this contemporaneous account. He said, the people said, we know that the holy Jews of Constantinople will redeem us from captivity. And so they decided to go into it, to risk it with the slave traders rather than deal with the Cossack butchers. Here we have, I um, brought to you a, um, a, a, a piece here by the a memoir of Yaakov Koppel Margolis. Um, in his life story, which he sold to printers in Venice, um, in the hopes that he could he could um, gain gain some funds, and he says he was swept up by the ca ca catastrophe that hit the land of Poland. I, my son, and my daughter were part of the mass of captives sent into exile. They put us in iron chains. They took us away to a foreign com country. In tears, I asked myself, "Who is with me? Who will protect me?" Who in heaven will rescue me from these stormy waters? So I decided to go to the local leaders thinking that they can free captives from their imprisonment. And through them, God, the just creator of the world, released me from my captivity. And indeed, thanks to him, the famous leaders, those righteous and pious benefactors of the Istanbul community, and in particular, those scholars who study Torah day and night and take care of the Jews held by cruel masters, took pity on me and moved and had me ransomed. But despite this, God has treated me harshly, and my children remain in captivity. I have traveled from country to country, collecting money, small sums, and large, for my poor lambs who await me every day, lost in the clutches 
of cruel and evil men. So here we get a little glimpse of some important things. First of all, um, some people managed to make it to the slave market, but some people didn't. You know, young children, um, unattractive women, older people did not make it to the slave market because they were they were not seen as 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 uh, worth the investment and the risk. And so the slave traders um, who would march people in chains to Crimea and from Crimea would sail the Black Sea to to Constantinople. Um, not everybody made it. And so families were very often broken up. Um, we see also a, a, something interesting. Here's a story from that tells us a little bit about the refugee network and how families were were broken up. So um, in 1649, we know of a story of, of a man named Yoel. He arrives in Holostov in, in Moravia, and he wanted to begin a new life. And so he was hoping he could take a new wife, and he figured he, his family is lost, and maybe, you know, he, he gets word through the refugee network that, uh, that in fact, his wife had been captured and converted to Islam. So if she's captured and converted to Islam, so there's a there's a section of the halakha that says that we can consider her an ishamo redet, a, a woman in rebellion. And under those circumstances, by Jewish law, we can uh, we can suspend the the requirement of Rabbeinu Gershon, and we can allow him to take a second wife. Um, and he he appealed to a very famous rabbi. Uh, the rabbi who wrote the Turi, the Turi Zahav. Um, Turi Zahav is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. Very well-respected rabbi. Now, the rabbi did not have his Sfarim with him at the time. He said, like, he wrote back in his tshuva, I, I'm, he too was a refugee. And he said, I cannot consult my library, and I'm sending you this, this based on my recollections. The other rabbis of the time were outraged. They thought, this is horrible. How can you, how can you let this man remarry? Right, any woman who's put into captivity, all of a sudden we let her husband remarry. This is a, this is a scandal, and it would have been an, a scandal. But then there was good news from the refugee network. A little later, he says, "I received a letter from a man called Yoshua, the maternal uncle of the woman, the wife, in which he wrote that she had been captured by the Tatars and ransomed in Istanbul, and she preserved her righteousness and never converted." He added that she was on her way back in the town of Isai a small group of Jews who had been captured and ransomed with her. Not long after that, she reached the Lublin district in Poland and wrote to her husband here saying that he should go back and reclaim what he had lost, which he did. He traveled to her and lovingly took her back as his wife. This story has a very nice ending. Not all of the stories uh, have such a nice ending, but what does this show us? This shows us a couple of things. First of all, it shows us that families were broken up and it could be devastating. And it doesn't always end this well. I don't think we should be naive to think that it did. Second things we should understand is that there was a refugee network, right? And you hear stories after the Shoah of people, you know, checking the boards, checking references, going, traveling to different DP camps, looking for relatives, trying to find information. Person, do you know this person? People were collecting and sharing. And the same thing was happening here. After the Gezerah Tachvatat, there was this whole network of people trying to reconnect families and trying to engage in this, this process of, of putting people back together after redemption, right? Because it's one thing to redeem them. It's another thing to figure out where, where people migrated to um, in the interim. What were the slave condition, conditions like unto the Tatars? So again, I mentioned that they weren't, you know, you only had value if you were if you were saleable, and they also you know the, the Tatars in the Black Sea would sell ten thousand slaves a year. They would capture Slavs, right? The word the word slave is not a Latin word. It rather comes from the principal the principal ethnicity of people who were slaves in the Middle Ages, which were Slavs. And they were they were transported from the Slavic lands to Crimea, sold on the Black Sea, and, and probably the biggest market of the time was Istanbul. And scholars of this period say that that they would rival 
the American, the, the slave trade of Africans to the West Indies and to the Americas for, um, for their plantations. Uh, it, it just it's worth noting that slavery is an ugly stain on all of humanity. It does not it does not erase the stain on, on, on the Americas. Uh, it does not make this in any sense um, uh, uh, better, but it is also not exclusive. Um, and not only were our ancestors part of this slave trade, as both, uh, unfortunately, both as the product and the purveyors in various capacities, although we were, I don't think we were the principal, um, so were the Venetians um, and many others. Um, anyway, that said, what did, what was th this group of people who were involved in the slave trade at 10,000 people a year? Well, they had this, they may have taken 40,000 captives, some estimates, which are probably high, from Rabbi Natan Nata of Hanover, the author of the Event Mitzula. He thinks that they took 40,000 captives in 1648. That's four times their annual haul. So they bottomed out the market because they were flooded with with product right and slaves are they're not uh they're not like uh i don't know hunks of coal right you you have to feed them or they're not worth anything so it it created a real market turbulence which meant you know there's a there's a there's a verse from the book of Yirmiyahu that says that you will be sold as slaves ve'en kone and there won't be anyone to buy you. You'll be so worthless that we no one to buy you. That prophecy, in a sense, comes true here. And you see this. The Tatar burned babies and the elderly in, you'll forgive me on the pronunciation, Zivativ. And because they did not want to take them captive, it was young men and women that they picked up for captivity. And the verse, they sold my people for no fortune. This is from Yirmiyahu. They set no price on me, was fulfilled there because one person would be sold for only one zloty and a few, few grozi, right? This is the Petach Tshuva of Gabriel Bar Yoshua Schusberg of Reza. Um, I was taken into captivity together with minister. So this is a, the next piece is a, is a testimony of Mayor Bar Yitzchak. And it's in front, it should be, it shouldn't say in form, in front of a Beit Din in Istanbul. Because in Istanbul, they um, they need to figure out. Okay, did this guy die? Did can his wife remarry? How does this? They need to settle these matters for Inyane Gitin. He says, "I was taken into captivity together with Mr. Henach from Probishe. I asked him if he was married, and he answered that his wife, Mr. Dina, had vanished into captivity. Then the order came down from the Cossack general that the Tatars would kill all male prisoners and leave the women alive." And straight away, the Tatars began to kill all Jewish men, among them Minister Henoch. I saw it with my own eyes. Me, they dressed up in women's clothes because my beard had not yet started to show, and so I escaped death. Right? This tells us a couple of things. First of all, it tells us about how they tried to get information about were people's husbands alive or dead. It also tells us that um, in that scenario, when you're dealing with too much uh, product, who were the slaves that were sold? Women. Uh, and they were they were probably sold, you know, for prostitution. And and female slaves took a premium. And it just shows you how precarious it was would have been. Um, you know, if you're a man, you are you are killed. If you're a woman, perhaps worse. So that that's that's what it was like to be in the slave trade. This is a tshuva from the Yam Shel Shlomo, Rabbi Shlomo Luri, a very prominent rabbi in uh, in Poland. And he lives from 1510 to 1573. So he dies, you know, 75 years before our episode. But what that tells us is, is how the, the, it gives us a background, it gives us a baseline background of what was happening and what was it, what was it, what were the known quantities, the known features of the slave trade? Right, already seventy five years later, people will know this. He writes this in a tshuva, this or not a tshuva, rather. This is his commentary on the tractate of Gitin. 
And in Gitin, one of the, the latter chapters talks about, about um, the policy of ransoming captives. And it says you shouldn't ransom captives for more than they're worth because you will create a, a slave, you create a premium, right? If the slave traders run out of market, you know, there's nobody who needs slaves. Well, they just say that their slaves are Jewish because if their slaves are Jewish, then Jewish community will pay a premium to redeem a captive. And he writes about the policy that was clearly in effect for the Jewish community of, of Constantinople. And he says, Va'idna, nowadays, Anshe gomle chasadim be'eretz turgama, va'smuchim lahem, kodim ashvim yoter v'yoter chmichdeid mehem. Nowadays, the people of great kindness in the lands of the Ottomans, of Turkey, and, and the surrounding lands, um, they were redeemed captives for much more than they're worth. They give up on the stress that is placed on their community, which is one of the considerations that is articulated in the, um, in the, in the Talmud, that one of the reasons you can't do this is because the community will run out of funds. It will create too much stress on the financial wherewithal of the community. So here's Rabbi Luria says, Hashem Yosef al Tzcharam, may God add to their reward, and that which they do before God is 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 sitting waiting for them in Olam Haba. Right, and um, may God continue to to assist. Um, the the Jewish people are are suffering in the Gola. You have to, they should have mercy on the rest of the diaspora. So that they should not extinguish the embers of Israel. Right? There are, there are many um, um, uh, um, travails that come upon the Jewish people. There, there are many Jews who are forced into conversion. They're forced to work on Shabbat um, that is not sanctioned. If, the, if we do not redeem these captives, horrible things could happen. Maybe they'll kill them. And there is a concept that if, if, if the if the slaves are in danger or the captives are in danger, we we will redeem for more than they're worth. Therefore, he says, um, th their their generosity um, to do this is well placed. And may the help of God be with them. And I just quote, put one other line because this contextualizes it. There's another very in the yeshiva is a very famous piece of, of the Amshel Shlomo where he talks about what he had heard about the Marami Rutenberg, Rabbi Meir Rutenberg, who was a captive in in the 13th century, um, um, captured by Emperor Rudolf II in the Ansheim Tower, and Rabbi Rutenberg, at least by by what Rabbi Luria heard, refused to be redeemed. It's a whole story on its own, but I just put it there because so you know. That this is where that whole sub, both of these historical subjects are dealt with in the Yam Shel Shlomo. But the takeaway here is that already, we can say in 1573 or earlier, Constantinople was a, known as a place that would redeem Jewish captives. Now, this was an expensive deal, and Constantinople didn't do it alone. We, I, I took a slice of these from some important Jewish communities, but the, um, there's a an Israeli scholar, um, Yisrael Halperin, who wrote a, a very interesting article on on Pidyon Shvuyim, um, on the redemptive captives in the in the Middle Ages, and um, and here he he gives us a whole list of of, of communities that helped support this. Posen, um, we have the list of the the appointments of two gabaim redeeming captives, and they did they many communities did their sort of changing of the guards, of installing their officers on Cholomite Pesach. Yep. So this is, is Passover 1642. The Sephardic community of Hamburg, 1653 and onward, records in its Pinkasim, 
the uh, funds dedicated for the redemption of captives. Prague, the Pinkas, the community ledger um, of the Niftarim, which talks about those who have passed away, it, it lists certain individuals as gabayim, as collectors, for pidyon shfuyim, for the redemptive of captives. And we have entries 1630, 1635, 1657, 1704, and probably more. Um, and Amsterdam, the regulations of the merged community, the Talmud Torah of Amsterdam, uh, they they gave very regularly to um, pidyon shfuyim. Venice was extremely active in this. Um, and uh, there are many, many documents in Venice, one of which is just the Pinchas uh, Hevra Mishnayot, uh, it has nothing to do with cheese. Apologies on the autocorrect there. Um, one of the things that happened in Istanbul that, that allowed the Jewish uh, community to do this was they put a tax on all the Jewish ships that would arrive in port. It was called the Gavila. Um, and people complain that it's not fair, right? That why does this money go into the hands of the Jewish community of Istanbul, right? When it comes from all over, it's not really fair. It's an inappropriate tax. And Rabbi Yosef of Trani, the Ma, the uh, the Marit, um, the, he says, no, it is fair because really these, these he says, those who come from Russia, meaning the Slavic lands, it's incumbent upon all to redeem them. For now that this is spread across the Black Sea every day, new ones come in chains, everybody's going to be responsible. And then they they also had similar taxes in some of the other um, Ottoman ports, Thessaloniki and Andrianople. But again, this is another way. Some people gave voluntarily, and sometimes they put this on the ships because you know a ship could carry olive oil, and it could also carry slaves, and it could carry slaves and olive oil. And the sailors were involved in everything. And so maybe it was fair to put this on them. This is, uh, Halperin um, shows us this letter. Um, this, what you see here is the uh, uh, of a, an image of the actually handwritten letter from the rabbis of Constantinople to their, um, their compatriots in, in Mantua. This is a fascinating piece of history. First of all, you can see it. It's pretty clear also that there wasn't just one sent to Mantua, and it also, it gives us a little bit of a clear picture of what they were seeing. They write, since in our sinful state, the, the Jewish um, the Jewish community, the rabbis, they, the organized communities, they always appropriate upon themselves guilt. They won't often say what they're guilty for, but they'll say, this must be happening because of our sins. There, there was a sense that Jewish community took responsibility for for its own position. And part of that may be very much related to Tisha B'Av in the sense that we are in the diaspora and we are to a certain extent powerless because of our own sins. Okay. The sorrow of our brothers, the captives, continues to grow in, and intensify every day. And new captives come day by day, including a great rabbi with his many students and many of the nobility of the congregation, the scientists and their wives and sons. What man who fears Hashem sees a person of Israel in such a state and is not filled with mercy, even more so than many people who are imprinted with Torah, women and children, infants and nursing mothers, naked, starving, and barefoot. The cost is greater than we can bear, and therefore we are sending a second messenger to you. And the city of Mantua did give um, to, to these, and as did many of the other cities in Italy. Uh, but you can see that this was a constant, uh, you had to constantly fundraise for this. Um, and it's possible also that the uh, the rabbis in Constantinople may have exaggerated a little bit, because it seems pretty clear that they would not have uh, brought um, uh, people who were not, um, they wouldn't have brought infants, it just wasn't worth their while, generally speaking, at least in the year of Tach Matat. Um, so it could be that there's a, a little bit of exaggeration in this, but in a case of, in a case like this, of pidyon shvuyim, of something which is so heartbreaking, you know, perhaps they just needed to convey in words the, 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 I, this is only a little small section of the letter. I didn't include every, every word, but they also intensify and they pull on the heartstrings a lot, which they are certainly entitled to do. And I think we should take it as a badge of pride, though, that the Jewish community of Constantinople took this upon themselves. They wouldn't let a Jew go to the slave market. And it didn't matter what it cost the community. 
And then they figured out how to fundraise on that about that on the back end, um, rather than than worrying about the money. First, they worried about the people, and it, I think, and you can see as far away as as Poland, right in 1570s, they knew that the, the Jewish community of Constantinople would rescue Jews from that slave market. The um, and clearly the Jews in Ukraine, when they chose to go to the Tatars. They understood how this works. They understood what happens when you when you become you know part of the chattel of a group of Tatars and you're you're sold in Crimea and you know you get flushed down the toilet and hopefully you know somebody rescues us from the trap in in Istanbul. But they they were counting on and maybe with good reason that the that the I I, I say with good reason I, I, not to to say the Chas the Jews of Istanbul wouldn't redeem them, but but the the journey from from Ukraine all the way to Istanbul was certainly fraught with ways that you could die. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead because this is that one slide out of order. Okay. Now we, we dealt with the, the captives, but let's deal now with the refugees. So this is a letter from the Jewish community of Krakow Look, who had taken many, many hundreds of Jews, maybe even thousands of Jews, because Krakow is sort of in central Poland, and these Jews are coming from Ukraine. You know, it's uh, it's it's uh, strangely similar to what's happening now, or really what happened last year, maybe, is when, uh, when Russia st- invaded Ukraine, Avi Balmuhu was in Krakow, former rabbi of the Shara Tzedek. He was involved in in rescuing Jewish refugees that came in there by the hundreds. And, and our community was one of those that, that helped to support those projects. So here um, we, we get a picture of what the refugee situation looked like from Ukraine into Poland. Of the dead, more have died of starvation than of plague. They could not be buried because they did not have the necessities. Linen for shrouds, wood for coffins. For that reason, many are laid on the ground until their bellies split, their bodies became distended, and worms and maggots begin to eat them. Last Friday, a hundred Jews were buried together, all because there were no coffins. So they ran out of materials for uh, for the um, for for doing the burial. I, I read this yesterday, if it looks familiar, <laughs> um, but it made sense to reintroduce it here. The grave diggers themselves have died. Until now, more than a thousand Jews have died great students and pious leaders, the least of whom could have made a complete world. For our sins, those who survive are already weak and exhausted from starvation. Their situation is grave. They have run out of money even after we made a special collection before we left Krakow. Now at our committee meeting here in Okluz, we have made another special collection for the poor, but that too will not be enough to cover even half of what they need. So Krakow was taking in refugees, and we see this just sort of your first snapshot of how surrounding communities um, are going to be picking up refugees. Um, this is just a, gives you a sense of of how how the stream of refugees arrived in different places. So this is from Hamburg. The, the the what happens is it looks like people go down the Vistula River, they go into the Baltic and across to Hamburg. Um, so. That's how they. That's why Hamburg is such a close, um, a close port of call. In addition to the Jews who have so far left Poland, a, a big vestigial barge full of another four hundred has just arrived here today to go to Germany. They, the Jews, cannot bear to stay in Poland any longer on account of the hatred of the nobility, which has been stirred up by their excessive privileges in Poland and their self-serving behavior in the town. So this just gives you a sense of okay now we have hundreds of of refugees arriving in in Poland. By the way, this particular correspondence does not talk at all of the carnage that Chmelnitsky is visiting upon the Jews, um, um, and it's just simply sort of um, um, their hatred of the nobility and excessive privileges. Well, that hardly describes the situation. This is the Pinkas Hamdina of Lithuania. All of these communities had, they were, they were um, internally run 
communities. They were self-governed communities uh, because the non-Jews didn't, the, the citizenship didn't yet exist um, and certainly not for Jews if it did. So they said to the Jews, look, you guys make us money here. You guys, you know, you trade, you lend money, you do all sorts of wonderful things. That's fine. But we really don't want to have to deal with you and your your uh, problems. So set up your own your own courts. We, we'd also like to have one person to collect the taxes from. So they had these autonomous communities. And all of them had ledgers. They kept the minutes of, of, the, of those organizations. This is these are the minutes of the Lithuanian community when the refugees from Chmelnitsky arrived. Right? Hundreds and thousands of people. So Akim Bemarnafsham who cry out in the bitterness of their soul. And we see how terrible this is. Right? Our, our mercy pours out on them. So we are going to take care of, we will take care of 2,000 people. We'll, we have room for 2,000 refugees, which we can keep until Rosh Chodesh Iyar. Um, may it come upon us for good. Latilam al Kokila, and we'll place this on, we'll, we'll distribute the, the burden over the entire congregation. And he says, Yatil mispari aniim al Kokila biyishu. So we'll divide it, you know, every little town might get a certain number of aniim. And how do they divide it? So half of them, we can do it from communal funds. Um, and then they said, We're going to make little notes. Everybody will do it according to the amount that he has. And each one of the refugees will have a kvittel. And then every week, they're going to pair up these two things. Right? So if 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 your kvittel says 127, and the family's kvittel says 127, so you're going to, you're going to go to family 127, happens to be Goldschmidt, right? That's how they would pair that up. This, you see exactly the mechanism they used. It was sort of a, it was a, you live in my house scenario. Um, and then it goes on and says, well, you know, um, sometimes one person can't afford. Um, um, the, and the community is going to have to figure, figure out. Um, and he says, um, the it's going to have to do done with estimation. Whoever has capacity to hold the nefesh achat, right? If you can't hold, if you can't do um, one by yourself, so you'll share it with somebody else who also has that level of ability to support. So we see in this. The um, um, uh, the the way in which they set this whole project up. Okay, um, and I think again, I think just editorializing. I think it's a beautiful thing to see that here, you know, they're they're willing to to take these refugees into their homes if they can't find the money to do it. Otherwise, they actually create a system of home hospitality. But. It's not always uh, butterflies and uh, and hallmark specials here. Uh, it got quite complicated because absorbing this number of refugees, even to a very prosperous community, could be very difficult. And up until this point, many of the communities had something called the Cheskat Yishuv. Cheskat Yishuv really sunsetted, but it it still had, I think, vestiges, which may, basically says, look, the government knows how many Jews are in this city. And the government doesn't want us to have, you know, 200 more because that's more mouths to feed and and is that really economically viable and and you know all the sort of typical fears you're going to have about a refugee population so here the letter from the imperial administration concerning the jews of prague more or less you have you have till the sundown to get out of town Having received trustworthy information that a large number of foreign Jews, many of them bearing disease, 
coming from Poland and other places, not only to the various regions of Bohemia, but to Prague. We have told the regional governors to make it well enough known that wherever these Jews are found, they are to be expelled. So the, the, the government says we need to get rid of them. There are a couple kernels of information in here which are very important. One kernel of information which is very important is that they came with a lot of disease. This we can confirm to be true from many other sources. Uh, two is that the Jewish community wanted to keep them and they actually tried to keep them secret. And three is that the authorities were like, these are too many people, we're going to deport them. Um, Frankfurt, as an example, was a, was a Jewish community where, you know, again, it wasn't all perfect. Um, they, they, in their record books re mentioned only one refugee. Uh, they did raise money for the redemption of captives in Istanbul, but they were not very wild on taking refugees, at least initially. Uh, Vienna. Um, um, so, um, again, sort of a similar scenario to Prague that they saw it. it was apparent that foreign Jews have crept in large numbers and now chose to wheel and deal shamelessly. All those foreign Jews who have no special royal privilege shall within at most 14 days from this date be well and truly driven out. So this is a case, again, where the government says, wow, we're being overwhelmed. The, you Jews have to go. Um, and here, this is from the Pinkas of Hamburg. And this is the initial response of Hamburg. The leaders of the Ashkenazi community, and, oh, I should background. Uh, Hamburg has three communities, really, that are attached to it. There's Hamburg proper. That's where the Sephardic Jewish community was. Those were, those were, were former Muranos who were wealthy Jews who sort of, um, similar to Amsterdam, they sort of revived their congregation. And that was the Germans liked them because these were wealthy trader Jews. And I know it, it's sort of the opposite of what you think of in Israel today. That the you know Ashkenazi Jews are sort of seem higher class, and the and the Sephardic Jews seem lower class of a sort. But back then it was exactly the opposite. Um, that the Sephardic Jews were the high class people, and the Ashkenazi Jews were the low class people. Uh, that's clear. I don't. I can't speak as accurately about today, but back then it seems like that's exactly how things were. So the leaders of the Ashkenazi community, oh, and so the Sephardic community was in Hamburg. The Ashkenazi community wasn't allowed in Hamburg, so they lived in Altona. And then there was a third community that was associated with Denmark, which is called Wandsbeck. And so that was uh, the third, third community. Anyway, the leaders of the Ashkenazi community in Altona, which is right next to Hamburg, have informed us that 130 of our brothers in faith from Poland have arrived in Lubeck, which is another city in the Hanseatic League, in great distress. There are nothing to see in Lubeck. They will reach here by tomorrow. It was decided to grant them 20 Reichstaller to cover the cost of the journey. Once they get here, we will see how they can be helped further. No commitments. So this is, again, from the Pinkas of Hamburg. This is from their community records. There's a, a memoir, which I have to uh, thank, um, was shared with me at one point by uh, Anita Rudolph. Um, and this is the... Uh, um, Gleekel of Hunger, Hamburg. Again, sorry for the typo uh, there, Hamlin. And she writes, After this, the Jews of Vilnius fled Poland, and many of them came to Hamburg suffering with contagious disease. Now, this is our proof that there was disease, right? At that time, there was no hectish. The hectish is a, it was a building where they would keep the sick or the refugees. It was a special sort of, almost like a hospital for the people who are truly pitiful. The community's um, supported these because they needed a place to take care of the poor and the sick or any other houses in which to house the sick. At least 10 of them were sent to rest in our attic and father had had them looked after. Some of them recovered, others died. So in her home, her father had an attic and they took some of these sick people because there was no designated house for them. So the father, you know, had the women look after these sick. My sister Elka and I also con contracted the disease. But they were young, so it seems they survived. My pious grandmother visited the sick and assured that they had everything they needed. She would visit them in the attic three or four times a day. Eventually, she also caught the disease and languished for 10 days before she died. So this tells us there were individual people who were opening their homes to these refugees. But it was difficult because they, they did spread disease. 
and it, there were negative con consequences. A, a sermon by Rabbi David Cohen of Hamburg. Since our brothers who for our sins, again, we have that same pattern, right? Because of our sins, have been forced to leave Poland on account of the war and the atrocities, unfortunately, increasingly exposed to suffering, persecution, and misery, we should extend them our compassionate assistance, as we have done on many occasions. The expense involved is more than our community can bear. So the Ma'amad has decided to hold a charitable meeting for us to help the many souls who have recently come here, hungry and naked, and may still yet be coming. It also pro proclaims that the financial resources of the autonomous community are not enough even to feed these people. This support of refugees is an act of pure kindness in which many religious commandments are involved. It is our most fervent hope that our pious and open-hearted people will once again demonstrate their usual grace and great-heartedness. He is basically saying, you guys, I need, I need individual charity. You can't rely on the dues that you're giving the community. Because we don't have, we the community don't have enough to fund them. It has to be you, the household owner, the balabas, who who has to assist in this. Um, Amsterdam, more or less. I'm not. Uh, there are more sources, but I'm not going to belabor with them. Um, three ships come to Amsterdam, three hundred Jews, and initially, Amsterdam is also a very is a place which tries to provide them some temporary accommodation. But what becomes clear, um, you know, this is uh, this is from the Be'er Hagola. He's a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. He's a great rabbi, and he waxes lyrical about how how hospitable the the Jewish community of Amsterdam was. But um, it seems that they they sort of ran out of money, or they weren't willing to support it to that extent. So they started to develop a policy of helping people move on to their next city. Um, and in Amsterdam, we know that many of the Polish Jews were reduced to begging in the streets. Um, some were able to become tailors, leather workers, cobblers, um, working, albeit illegally, but they started to, to gain work there. Um, this might have also angered some of the non-Jewish uh, um, burghers of, of Amsterdam. Um, and this was always a risk. And what you see is that when it comes to raising money for Pidyon Shvuyim, every single congregation was involved and sent money. When it comes to housing the refugees, they initially open up their drawers with generosity, but it can become very, um, it can become very um, challenging to sustain that kind of support for people for that long, and it certainly it shows signs of withering and waning in many of these communities. Um, and here, this is just, these are just from the Pinkas of Amsterdam um, that we're telling, they, they, they essentially made funds available to allow the refugees to move westward to other locations. Presumably the idea was, well, you know, if I find a town that is not overwhelmed, that only has, you know, five extra families, if I'm a sixth family of an extra five, it's better than me being the 30th family in Amsterdam. 